can Beautrelet use his colossal brain power to rescue his kidnapped father? Maurice LeBlanc, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. You are now part of an award-winning audiobook production team. Your monthly donation of just $5 helps to keep us creating audiobooks of classic literature that are not only entertaining and educational, but they are winning awards. And so thank you for helping to create a place where folks like you can find solid performances of heavily curated classics. And for your $5 donation, we will give you a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook from our store. It's our way of showing our appreciation, and you get a chance to build out your audiobook library. Everybody wins! Go now to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. If it's more convenient, we are streaming our episodes through YouTube now. A link can be found in the comments section for today's episode. For those of you who enjoy the personal moments, I've decided to release those stories as a special feature you can access in the app. That way they don't get in the way here, but for those who enjoy them, they are still available through the app. Today, you can hear about Rocket Man. And now, The Hollow Needle. Part 5 of 7, by Maurice LeBlanc. Chapter 5, On the Track Young Beautrelet was stunned by the violence of the blow. As a matter of fact, although in publishing his article, he had obeyed one of those irresistible impulses which make a man despise every consideration of prudence, he had never really believed in the possibility of an abduction. His precautions had been too thorough. The friends at Cherbourg not only had instructions to guard and protect Beautrelet the Elder, they were also to watch his comings and goings, never to let him walk out alone, and not even to hand him a single letter without first opening it. No, there was no danger. Lupin, wishing to gain time, was trying to intimidate his adversary. The blow, therefore, was almost unexpected, and Isidore, because he was powerless to act, felt the pain of the shock during the whole of the remainder of the day. One idea alone supported him, that of leaving Paris, going down there, seeing for himself what had happened, and resuming the offensive. He telegraphed to Cherbourg. He was at Saint-Lazare a little before nine. A few minutes later, he was steaming out of the station in the Normandy Express. It was not until an hour later, when he mechanically unfolded a newspaper, which he had bought on the platform, that he became aware of the letter by which Lupin indirectly replied to his article of that morning. To the editor of the Grand Journal, sir, I cannot pretend but that my modest personality, which would certainly have passed unnoticed in more heroic times, has acquired a certain prominence in the dull and feeble period in which we live. But there is a limit beyond which the morbid curiosity of the crowd cannot go without becoming indecently indiscreet. If the walls that surround our private lives be not respected, what is to safeguard the rights of the citizen? Will those who differ plead the higher interest of truth? An empty pretext, in so far as I am concerned, because the truth is known, and I raise no difficulty about making an official confession of the truth in writing. Yes, Mademoiselle de saint varin is alive. Yes, I love her. Yes, I have the mortification not to be loved by her. Yes, the results of the boy Beautrelet's inquiry are wonderful in their precision and accuracy. Yes, we agree on every point. There is no riddle left. There is no mystery. Well, then, 
What? Injured to the very depths of my soul, bleeding still from cruel wounds, I ask that my more intimate feelings and secret hopes may no longer be delivered to the malevolence of the public. I ask for peace, the peace which I need to conquer the affection of Mademoiselle de saint Varin, and to wipe out from her memory the thousand little injuries which she has had to suffer at the hands of her uncle and cousin. This has not been told, because of her position as a poor relation. Mademoiselle de saint Varin will forget this hateful past. All that she can desire, were it the fairest jewel in the world, were it the most unattainable treasure, I shall lay at her feet. She will be happy. She will love me. But, if I am to succeed once more, I require peace. That is why I lay down my arms and hold out the olive branch to my enemies, while warning them, with every magnanimity on my part, that a refusal on theirs might bring down upon them the gravest consequences. One word more on the subject of Mr. Harlington. This name conceals the identity of an excellent fellow, who is secretary to Cooley, the American millionaire, and instructed by him to lay hands upon every object of ancient art in Europe which it is possible to discover. His evil star brought him into touch with my friend Etienne de Vaudray, alias Arsène Lupin, alias myself. He learnt in this way that a certain Monsieur de Gevre was willing to part with four pictures by Rubens, ostensibly on the condition that they were replaced by copies, and that the bargain to which he was consenting remained unknown. My friend Vaudray also undertook to persuade Monsieur de Gevre to sell his chapel. The negotiations were conducted with entire good faith on the side of my friend Vaudray, and with charming ingenuousness on the side of Mr. Harlington, until the day when the Rubenses and the carvings from the chapel were in a safe place, and Mr. Harlington in prison. There remains nothing, therefore, to be done but to release the unfortunate American, because he was content to play the modest part of a dupe to brand the millionaire coolly, because, for fear of possible unpleasantness, he did not protest against his secretary's arrest, and to congratulate my friend Etienne de Vaudray, because he is revenging the outraged morality of the public by keeping the hundred thousand francs which he was paid on account by that singularly unattractive person, Cooley. Pray pardon the length of this letter, and permit me to be, sir, your obedient servant, Arsène Lupin. Isidore weighed the words of this communication, as minutely, perhaps, as he had studied the document concerning the hollow needle. He went on the principle, the correctness of which was easily proved, that Lupin had never taken the trouble to send one of his amusing letters to the press without absolute necessity, without some motive which events were sure, sooner or later, to bring to light. What was the motive for this particular letter? For what hidden reason was Lupin confessing his love and the failure of that love? Was it there that Beautrelet had to seek? Or in the explanations regarding Mr. Harlington, or further still, between the lines? Behind all those words whose apparent meaning had perhaps no other object than to suggest some wicked, perfidious, misleading little idea. For hours, the young man, confined to his compartment, remained pensive and anxious. The letter filled him with mistrust, as though it had been written for his benefit and were destined to lead him personally into error. For the first time, and because he found himself confronted not with a direct attack, but with an ambiguous, indefinable method of fighting, he underwent a distinct sensation of fear. And when he thought of his good old easy-going father, kidnapped through his fault, he asked himself with a pang whether he was not mad to continue so unequal a contest. Was the result not certain? 
Had Lupin not won the game in advance? It was but a short moment of weakness. When he alighted from his compartment at six o'clock in the morning, refreshed by a few hours' sleep, he had recovered all his confidence. On the platform, Probeval, the dockyard clerk who had given hospitality to Monsieur Beautrelet Sr., was waiting for him, accompanied by his daughter Charlotte, an imp of twelve or thirteen. Well, cried Isidore. The worthy man, beginning to moan and groan, he interrupted him, dragged him to a neighboring tavern, ordered coffee, and began to put plain questions, without permitting the other the slightest digression. My father has not been carried off, has he? It was impossible. Impossible. Still he has disappeared. Since when? We don't know. What? No. Yesterday morning at six o'clock, as I had not seen him come down as usual, I opened his door. He was gone. But was he there on the day before, two days ago? Yes. On the day before yesterday, he did not leave his room. He was a little tired, and Charlotte took his lunch up to him at twelve and his dinner at seven in the evening. So it was between seven o'clock in the evening on the day before yesterday and six o'clock on yesterday morning that he disappeared? Yes, during the night before last, only... Only what? Well, it's like this. You can't leave the arsenal at night. Do you mean that he has not left it? That's impossible. My friends and I have searched the whole naval harbor. Then he has left it. Impossible. Every outlet is guarded. Beautrelet reflected, and then said, What next? Next? I hurried to the commandant and informed the officer in charge. Did he come to your house? Yes. And the gentlemen from the public prosecutors also. They searched all through the morning, and when I saw that they were making no progress and that there was no hope left, I telegraphed to you. Was the bed disarranged in his room? No. Nor the room disturbed in any way? No. I found his pipe in its usual place with his tobacco and the book which he was reading. There was even this little photograph of yourself in the middle of the book, marking the page. Let me see it. Frobeval passed him the photograph. Beautrelet gave a start of surprise. He had recognized himself in the snapshot, standing with his two hands in his pockets, on a lawn from which rose trees and ruins. Froberval added, It must be the last portrait of yourself which you sent him. Look on the back, you will see the date. 3 April. The name of the photographer, R. de Val, and the name of the town, Lyon, Lyon sur Mer, perhaps. Isidore turned the photograph over and read this little note, in his own handwriting. R. Duval, 3.4, Lyon. He was silent for a few minutes and resumed. My father hadn't shown you that snapshot yet? No, and that's just what astonished me when I saw it yesterday. For your father used so often to talk to us about you. There was a fresh pause greatly prolonged. Froberval muttered, I have business at the workshop. We might as well go in. He was silent. Isidore had not taken his eyes from the photograph, was examining it from every point of view. At last, the boy asked, Is there such a thing as an inn called the Leon d'Or at a short league outside the town? Yes, about a league from here. On the Route de Valogne, is it? Yes, on the Route de Valogne. Well, I have every reason to believe that this inn was the headquarters of Lupin's friends. It was from there that they entered into communication with my father. What an idea! Your father spoke to nobody. He saw nobody. He saw nobody, but they made use of an intermediary. What proof have you? This photograph. But it's your photograph. It's my photograph, but it was not sent by me. I was not even aware of its existence. It was taken without my knowledge in the ruins of Ambrumacy, doubtless by the examining magistrate's clerk. 
who, as you know, was an accomplice of Arsène Lupin's. And then? Then this photograph became the passport, the talisman, by means of which they obtained my father's confidence. But who? Who was able to get into my house? I don't know, but my father fell into the trap. They told him, and he believed, that I was in the neighborhood, that I was asking to see him, and that I was giving him an appointment at the Golden Lion. But all this is nonsense. How can you assert? Very simply, they imitated my writing on the back of the photograph and specified the meeting place. Valogne Road, three kilometers, four hundred, Lion Inn. My father came, and they seized him, that's all. Very well muttered Froberval, dumbfounded. Very well, I admit it. Things happened as you say, but that does not explain how he was able to leave during the night. He left in broad daylight, though he waited until dark to go to the meeting place. But confound it, he didn't leave his room the whole of the day before yesterday. There is one way of making sure. Run down to the dockyard, Froberval and look for one of the men who were on guard in the afternoon two days ago. Only be quick, if you wish to find me here. Are you going? Yes. I shall take the next train back. What? Why, you don't know. Your inquiry. My inquiry is finished. I know pretty well all that I wanted to know. I shall have left Cherbourg in an hour. Froberval rose to go. He looked at Beautrelet with an air of absolute bewilderment hesitated a moment, and then took his cap. "'Are you coming, Charlotte?' "'No,' said Beautrelet. "'I shall want a few more particulars. Leave her with me. Besides, I want to talk to her. I knew her when she was quite small.' Froberval went away. Beautrelet and the little girl remained alone in the tavern smoking room. A few minutes passed. A waiter entered, cleared away some cups, and left the room again. The eyes of the young man and the child met, and Beautrelet placed his hand very gently on the little girl's hand. She looked at him for two or three seconds distractedly, as though about to choke. Then, suddenly, hiding her head between her folded arms, she burst into sobs. He let her cry, and after a while said, It was you, wasn't it, who did all the mischief, who acted as go-between? It was you who took him the photograph. You admit it, don't you? And when you said that my father was in his room two days ago, you knew that it was not true, did you not? Because you yourself had helped him to leave it. She made no reply. He asked, Why did you do it? They offered you money, I suppose, to buy ribbons with a frock? He uncrossed Charlotte's arms and lifted up her head. He saw a poor little face all streaked with tears, the attractive, disquieting, mobile face of one of those little girls who seem marked out for temptation and weakness. Come, said Beautrelet. It's over. We'll say no more about it. I will not even ask you how it happened. Only you must tell me everything that can be of use to me. Did you catch anything? Any remark made by those men? How did they carry him off? She replied at once. By motor car. I heard them talking about it. And what road did they take? Ha! Huh? I don't know that. Didn't they say anything before you? Something that might help us? No. Wait, though. There was one who said, We shall have no time to lose. The governor is to telephone to us at eight o'clock in the morning. Where to? I can't say. I've forgotten. Try. Try and remember. It was the name of a town, wasn't it? Yes, a name. Like Chateau. Chateau Briand? Chateau Thierry? No, no. Chateau Roux? Yes, that was it. Chateau Roux. Beautrelet did not wait for her to complete her sentence. Already he was on his feet, and without giving a thought to Froberval, without even troubling about the child, who stood gazing at him in stupefaction, 
he opened the door and ran to the station. Chateau Roux, madame, a ticket for Chateau Roux. Over man, Antour? asked the booking clerk. Of course, the shortest way. Shall I be there for lunch? Oh, no. For dinner? Bedtime? Oh, no. For that, you would have to go over to Paris. The Paris Express leaves at nine o'clock. You're too late. It was not too late. Beautrelet was just able to catch the train. Well, said Beautrelet, rubbing his hands, I've spent only two hours or so at Cherbourg, but they were well employed. He did not for a moment think of accusing Charlotte of lying. Weak, unstable, capable of the worst treacheries, those petty natures also obey impulses of sincerity. And Beautrelet had read in her affrighted eyes her shame for the harm which she had done, and her delight at repairing it in part. He had no doubt, therefore, that Chateau Roux was the other town to which Lupin had referred, and where his confederates were to telephone to him. On his arrival in Paris, Beautrelet took every necessary precaution to avoid being followed. He felt that it was a serious moment. He was on the right road that was leading him to his father. One act of imprudence might ruin all. He went to the flat of one of his schoolfellows and came out, an hour later, irrecognizable, rigged out as an Englishman of thirty, in a brown check suit with knickerbockers, woolen stockings, and a cap, a high-colored complexion, and a red wig. He jumped on a bicycle, laden with a complete painter's outfit, and rode off to the Gare d'Austerlitz. He slept that night at Isodin. The next morning, he mounted his machine at break of day. At seven o'clock, he walked into the Chateau Roux post office and asked to be put on to Paris. As he had to wait, he entered into conversation with the clerk and learnt that, two days before, at the same hour, a man dressed for motoring had also asked for Paris. The proof was established. He waited no longer. By the afternoon, he had ascertained from undeniable evidence that a limousine car, following the Tours Road, had passed through the village of Bouzancet and the town of Chateau Roux and had stopped beyond the town on the verge of the forest. At ten o'clock, a hired gig, driven by a man unknown, had stopped beside the car and then gone off south, through the valley of the Bouzan. There was then another person seated beside the driver. As for the car, it had turned in the opposite direction and gone north, toward Isodin. Beautrelet easily discovered the owner of the gig, who, however, had no information to supply. He had hired out his horse and trap to a man who brought them back himself the next day. Lastly, that same evening, Isidore found out that the motor car had only passed through Isodin, continuing its road toward Orléans, that is to say, toward Paris. From all this, it resulted, in the most absolute fashion, that Monsieur Beautrelet was somewhere in the neighborhood. If not, how was it conceivable that people should travel nearly three hundred miles across France in order to telephone from Chateau Roux and next to return at an acute angle by the Paris road? This immense circuit had a more definite object to move Monsieur Beautrelet to the place assigned to him. And this place is within reach of my hand, said Isidore to himself, quivering with hope and expectation. My father is waiting for me to rescue him at ten or fifteen leagues from here. He is close by. He is breathing the same air as I. He set to work at once. Taking a war office map, he divided it into small squares, which he visited one after the other, entering the farmhouses making the peasants talk, calling on the schoolmasters, the mayors, the parish priests, chatting to the women. It seemed to him that he must attain his end without delay, and his dreams grew until it was no longer his father alone whom he hoped to deliver, but all those whom Lupin was holding captive, Raymond de saint varin Ganimard, Sherlock Holmes, perhaps, and others, many others, and in reaching them, he would at the same time reach Lupin's stronghold.
his lair, the impenetrable retreat where he was piling up the treasures of which he had robbed the wide world. But, after a fortnight's useless searching, his enthusiasm ended by slackening, and he very soon lost confidence. Because success was slow in appearing from one day to the next almost, he ceased to believe in it. And, though he continued to pursue his plan of investigations, he would have felt a real surprise if his efforts had led to the smallest discovery. More days still passed by, monotonous days of discouragement. He read in the newspapers that the Comte de Gevre and his daughter had left Ambrumacy and gone to stay near Nice. He also learnt that Harlington had been released, that gentleman's innocence having become self-obvious, in accordance with the indications supplied by Arsène Lupin. Isidore changed his headquarters, established himself for two days at the Chartre, for two days at Argentan. The result was the same. Just then, he was nearly throwing up the game. Evidently, the gig in which his father had been carried off could only have furnished a stage, which had been followed by another stage, furnished by some other conveyance, and his father was far away. He was thinking of leaving, when one Monday morning he saw, on the envelope of an unstamped letter sent on to him from Paris, a handwriting that set him trembling with emotion. So great was his excitement that, for some minutes, he dared not open the letter for fear of a disappointment. His hand shook. Was it possible? Was this not a trap laid for him by his infernal enemy? He tore open the envelope. It was indeed a letter from his father, written by his father himself. The handwriting presented all the peculiarities, all the oddities of the hand which he knew so well. He read, Will these lines ever reach you, my dear son? I dare not believe it. During the whole night of my abduction, we travelled by motor-car, then in the morning by carriage. I could see nothing. My eyes were bandaged. The castle in which I am confined should be somewhere in the Midlands, to judge by its construction and the vegetation in the park. The room which I occupy is on the second floor. It is a room with two windows, one of which is almost blocked by a screen of climbing glycines. In the afternoon I am allowed to walk about the park at certain hours, but I am kept under unrelaxing observation. I am writing this letter on the mere chance of its reaching you and fastening it to a stone. Perhaps one day I shall be able to throw it over the wall and some peasant will pick it up. But do not be distressed about me. I am treated with every consideration. Your old father, who is very fond of you and very sad to think of the trouble he is giving you, Beautrelet. Isidore at once looked at the postmarks. They read, Cousin, Andre. The Andre, the department which he had been stubbornly searching for weeks. He consulted a little pocket guide which he always carried. Cousin, in the canton of Egouzon. He had been there too. For prudence sake, he disguided his personality as an Englishman which was becoming too well known in the district, disguised himself as a workman, and made for Cousillon. It was an unimportant village. He would easily discover the sender of the letter. For that matter, chance served him without delay. A letter posted on Wednesday last, exclaimed the mayor, a respectable tradesman in whom he confided, and who placed himself at his disposal. Listen, I think I can give you a valuable clue. On Saturday morning, Gaffer Charel, an old knife-grinder who visits all the fairs in the department, met me at the end of the village and asked, Monsieur le maire, does a letter without a stamp on it go all the same? Of course, said I, and does it get there? Certainly. Only there's double postage to pay on it, that's all the difference. And where does he live? He lives over there, all alone, on the slope. The hovel that comes next after the churchyard. Shall I go with you? 
It was a hovel standing by itself, in the middle of an orchard surrounded by tall trees. As they entered the orchard, three magpies flew away with a great splutter, and they saw that the birds were flying out of the very hole in which the watchdog was fastened, and the dog neither barked nor stirred as they approached. Beautrelet went up in great surprise. The brute was lying on its side, with stiff paws, dead. They ran quickly to the cottage. The door stood open. They entered. At the back of a low, damp room, on a wretched straw mattress, flung on the floor itself, lay a man fully dressed. Gaffer Charel, cried the mayor. Is he dead too? The old man's hands were cold, his face terribly pale but his heart was still beating with a faint, slow throb, and he seemed not to be wounded in any way. They tried to resuscitate him, and as they failed in their efforts, Beautrelet went to fetch a doctor. The doctor succeeded no better than they had done. The old man did not seem to be suffering. He looked as if he were just asleep, but with an artificial slumber, as though he had been put to sleep by hypnotism or with the aid of a narcotic. In the middle of the night that followed, however, Isidore, who was watching by his side, observed that the breathing became stronger, and that his whole being appeared to be throwing off the invisible bonds that paralyzed it. At daybreak, he woke up and resumed his normal functions, ate, drank, and moved about. But the whole day long, he was unable to reply to the young man's questions, and his brain seemed as though still numbed by an inexplicable torpor. The next day, he asked Beautrelet, What are you doing here, eh? It was the first time that he had shown surprise at the presence of a stranger beside him. Gradually, in this way, he recovered all his faculties. He talked, he made plans. But when Beautrelet asked him about the events immediately preceding his sleep, he seemed not to understand and Beautrelet felt that he really did not understand. He had lost the recollection of all that had happened since the Friday before. It was like a sudden gap in the ordinary flow of his life. He described his morning and afternoon on the Friday, the purchases he had made at the fair, the meals he had taken at the inn. Then, nothing, nothing more. He believed himself to be waking on the morrow of that day. It was horrible for Beautrelet. The truth lay there, in those eyes which had seen the walls of the park behind which his father was waiting for him, in those hands which had picked up the letter, in that muddled brain which had recorded the whereabouts of that scene, the setting, the little corner of the world in which the play had been enacted, and from those hands, from that brain, he was unable to extract the faintest echo of the truth so near at hand. Oh, that impalpable and formidable obstacle, against which all his efforts hurled themselves in vain, that obstacle built up of silence and oblivion. How clearly it bore the mark of Arsène Lupin. He alone, informed no doubt that M. Beautrelet had attempted to give a signal, he alone could have struck with partial death the one man whose evidence could injure him. It was not that Beautrelet felt himself to be discovered, or thought that Lupin, hearing of his stealthy attack and knowing that a letter had reached him, was defending himself against him personally, but what an amount of foresight and real intelligence it displayed to suppress any possible accusation on the part of that chance wayfarer. Nobody now knew that within the walls of a park there lay a prisoner asking for help. Nobody? Yes, Beautrelet. Gaffer Charel was unable to speak. Very well. But at least one could find out which fair the old man had visited and which was the logical road that he had taken to return by. And along this road, perhaps it would at last be possible to find... Isidore, as it was, had been careful not to visit Gaffer Charel's hovel except with the greatest precautions and in such a way as not to give an alarm. He now decided not to go back to it. 
he made inquiries and learnt that Friday was market day at Fresseline, a fair-sized town situated a few leagues off, which could be reached either by the rather winding high road or by a series of shortcuts. On the Friday, he chose the road and saw nothing that attracted his attention, no high-walled enclosure, no semblance of an old castle. He lunched at an inn at Fresseline and was on the point of leaving when he saw Gaffer Cherel arrive and cross the square, wheeling his little knife-grinding barrow before him. He had once followed him at a good distance. The old man made two interminable waits, during which he ground dozens of knives. Then, at last, he went away by a quite different road, which ran in the direction of Crozon and the market town of Eguzon. Beautrelet followed him along this road, but he had not walked five minutes before he received the impression that he was not alone in shadowing the old fellow. A man was walking along between them, stopping at the same time as Cherel, and starting off again when he did, without, for that matter, taking any great precautions against being seen. He is being watched, thought Beautrelet. Perhaps they want to know if he stops in front of the walls. His heart beat violently. The event was at hand. The three of them, one behind the other, climbed up and down the steep slopes of the country and arrived at Crozon, famed for the colossal ruins of its castle. There, Cherel made a halt of an hour's duration. Next, he went down to the riverside and crossed the bridge. But then a thing happened that took Beautrelet by surprise. The other man did not cross the river. He watched the old fellow move away, and when he had lost sight of him, turned down a path that took him right across the fields. Beautrelet hesitated for a few seconds as to what course to take, and then quietly decided. He set off in pursuit of the man. He has made sure, he thought, that Gaffer Cherel has gone straight ahead. That is all he wanted to know, and so he is going, where? To the castle? He was within touch of the goal. He felt it by a sort of agonizing gladness that uplifted his whole being. The man plunged into a dark wood, overhanging the river, and then appeared once more in the full light, where the path met the horizon. When Beautrelet, in his turn, emerged from the wood, he was greatly surprised no longer to see the man. He was seeking him with his eyes when, suddenly, he gave a stifled cry, and with a backward spring made for the line of trees which he had just left. On his right he had seen a rampart of high walls, flanked at regular distances by massive buttresses. It was there! It was there! Those walls held his father captive! he had found the secret place where Lupin confined his victim. He dared not quit the shelter which the thick foliage of the wood afforded him. Slowly, almost on all fours, he bore to the right, and in this way reached the top of a hillock that rose to the level of the neighboring trees. The walls were taller still. Nevertheless, he perceived the roof of the castle which they surrounded, an old Louis XIII roof, surmounted by very slender bell turrets arranged corbel-wise around a higher steeple which ran to a point. Beautrelet did no more that day. He felt the need to reflect and to prepare his plan of attack without leaving anything to chance. He held Lupin safe, and it was for Beautrelet now to select the hour and the manner of the combat. He walked away. Near the bridge, he met two country girls carrying pails of milk. He asked, What is the name of the castle over there, behind the trees? That's the Chateau de Angrier, sir. He had put his question without attaching any importance to it. The answer took away his breath. The Chateau de Angrier? Oh, but in what department are we? The Andre? Certainly not. The Andre is on the other side of the river. This side 
It's the Creuse. Isidore saw it all in a flash. The Chateau de Anglia, the department of the Creuse. L'Anglia Creuse, the hollow needle, the very key to the document, certain, decisive, absolute victory. Without another word, he turned his back on the two girls and went his way, tottering like a drunken man. Chapter 6 An Historic Secret Beautrelet's resolve was soon taken. He would act alone. To inform the police was too dangerous. Apart from the fact that he could only offer presumptions, he dreaded the slowness of the police, their inevitable indiscretions, the whole preliminary inquiry, during which Lupin, who was sure to be warned, would have time to effect a retreat in good order. At eight o'clock the next morning, with his bundle under his arm, he left the inn in which he was staying near Cousillon, made for the nearest thicket, took off his workman's clothes, became once more the young English painter that he had been, and went to call on the notary at Eguzon, the largest place in the immediate neighborhood. He said that he liked the country, and that he was thinking of taking up his residence there, with his relations if he could find a suitable house. The notary mentioned a number of properties. Beautrelet took note of them and let fall that someone had spoken to him of the Chateau de Anglia on the bank of the Creuse. Oh, yes, but the Chateau de Anglia, which has belonged to one of my clients for the last five years, is not for sale. He lives in it, then? He used to live in it, or rather his mother did, but she did not care for it, found the castle rather gloomy, so they left it last year. And is no one living there at present? Yes, an Italian, to whom my client let it for the summer season, Baron Anfredi. Oh, Baron Anfredi. A man still young, rather grave and solemn-looking? I'm sure I can't say. My client dealt with him direct. There was no regular agreement, just a letter. But you know the Baron? No, he never leaves the castle. Sometimes in his motor, at night, so they say. The marketing is done by an old cook who talks to nobody. They are queer people. Do you think your client would consent to sell his castle? I don't think so. It's an historic castle, built in the purest Louis XIII style. My client was very fond of it, and unless he has changed his mind... Can you give me his name and address? Louis Valmeras, 34, Rue du mont -Abor. Beautrelet took the train for Paris at the nearest station. On the next day but one, after three fruitless calls, he at last found Louis Valmeris at home. He was a man of about thirty, with a frank and pleasing face. Beautrelet saw no need to beat around the bush, stated who he was, and described his efforts and the object of the step which he was now taking. I have good reason to believe, he concluded, that my father is imprisoned in the Chateau de Anglia, doubtless in the company of other victims, and I have come to ask you what you know of your tenant, Baron Anfredi. Not much. I met Baron Anfredi last winter at Monte Carlo. He had heard by accident that I was the owner of the Chateau de Anglia, and as he wished to spend the summer in France, he made me an offer for it. He is still a young man? Yes, with very expressive eyes. Fair hair and a beard? Yes, ending in two points, which fall over a collar fastened at the back like a clergyman's. In fact, he looks a little like an English parson. It's he, murmured Beautrelet. It's he, as I have seen him. It's his exact description. What? Do you think? I think, I am sure, that your tenant is none other than Arsène Lupin. The story amused Louis Valmaris. He knew all the adventures of Arsène Lupin and the varying fortunes of his struggle with Beautrelet. He rubbed his hands. Ha! The Chateau de Longuier will become famous. I'm sure I don't mind, for, as a matter of fact, now that my mother no longer lives in it, I have always thought that I would get rid of it at the first opportunity. 
After this I shall soon find a purchaser. Only... Only what? I will ask you to act with the most extreme prudence, and not to inform the police until you are quite sure. Can you picture the situation? Supposing my tenant were not Arsène Lupin? Beautrelet set forth his plan. He would go alone at night. He would climb the walls. He would sleep in the park. Louis Valmeris stopped him at once. You will not climb walls of that height so easily. If you do, you will be received by two huge sheepdogs which belong to my mother and which I left behind at the castle. Pooh, a dose of poison. Much obliged. But suppose you escaped them, what then? How would you get into the castle? The doors are massive, the windows barred, and even then, once you were inside, who would guide you? There are eighty rooms. Yes, but that room with two windows, on the second story. I know it. We call it the glycine room, but how will you find it? There are three staircases and a labyrinth of passages. I can give you the clue and explain the way to you, but you would get lost just the same. Come with me said Beautrelet, laughing. I can't. I have promised to go to my mother in the south. Beautrelet returned to the friend with whom he was staying and began to make his preparations. But late in the day, as he was getting ready to go, he received a visit from Valmeras. Do you still want me? Rather. Well, I'm coming with you. Yes, the expedition fascinates me. I think it will be very amusing, and I like being mixed up in this sort of thing. Besides, my help will be of use to you. Look, here's something to start with. He held up a big key, all covered with rust and looking very old. What does the key open? asked Beautrelet. A little postern, hidden between two buttresses and left unused since centuries ago. I did not even think of pointing it out to my tenant. It opens straight on the country, just at the verge of the wood. Beautrelet interrupted him quickly. They know all about that outlet. It was obviously by this way that the man whom I followed entered the park. Come, it's fine game, and we shall win it. But by Jupiter, we must play our cards carefully. Two days later, a half-famished horse dragged a gypsy caravan into Crozon. Its driver obtained leave to stable it at the end of the village, in an old, deserted cart-shed. In addition to the driver, who was none other than Valmeras, there were three young men, who occupied themselves in the manufacture of wicker-work chairs, Beautrelet and two of his Janson friends. They stayed there for three days, waiting for a propitious, moonless night, and roaming singly round the outskirts of the park. Once Beautrelet saw the postern. Contrived between two buttresses placed very close together, it was almost merged, behind the screen of brambles that concealed it, in the pattern formed by the stones of the wall. At last, on the fourth evening, the sky was covered with heavy black clouds, and Valmaris decided that they should go reconnoitering, at the risk of having to return again, should circumstances prove unfavorable. All four crossed the little wood. Then Beautrelet crept through the heather, scratched his hands at the bramble hedge, and, half raising himself, slowly, with restrained movements, put the key into the lock. He turned it gently. Would the door open without an effort? Was there no bolt closing it on the other side? He pushed. The door opened without a creak or jolt. He was in the park. Are you there, Beautrelet? asked Valmaris. Wait for me. You two chaps, watch the door and keep our line of retreat open. At the least alarm, whistle. He took Beautrelet's hand and they plunged into the dense shadow of the thickets. A clearer space was revealed to them when they reached the edge of the central lawn. At the same moment, a ray of moonlight pierced the clouds and they saw the castle with its pointed turrets arranged around the tapering spire, to which, no doubt, it owed its name. There was no light in the windows, not a sound. Valmaris grasped his companion's arm. Keep still. What is it? The dogs. 
Over there, look. There was a growl. Almeris gave a low whistle. Two white forms leapt forward and in four bounds came and crouched at their master's feet. Gently, lie down, that's it. Good dogs, stay there. And he said to Beautrelet, And now let us push on. I feel more comfortable. Are you sure of the way? Yes, we are near the terrace. And then? I remember that on the left... At the place where the river terrace rises to the level of the ground floor windows, there is a shutter which closes badly and which can be opened from the outside. They found when they came to it that the shutter yielded to pressure. Valmeris removed a pane with a diamond which he carried. He turned the window latch. First one and then the other stepped over the balcony. They were now in the castle. At the end of a passage which divided the left wing into two. This room, said Valmeris, opens at the end of a passage. Then comes an immense hall, lined with statues, and at the end of the hall, a staircase, which ends near the room occupied by your father. He took a step forward. Are you coming, Botrelet? Yes, yes. But no, you're not coming. What's the matter with you? He seized him by the hand. It was icy cold, and he perceived that the young man was cowering on the floor. What's the matter with you? he repeated. Nothing. It'll pass off. But what is it? I'm afraid. You're afraid? Yes, Beautrelet confessed frankly. It's my nerves giving way. I generally manage to control them, but today, the silence, the excitement, and then, since I was stabbed by that magistrate's clerk, but it will pass off. There. It's passing now. He succeeded in rising to his feet, and Valmeris dragged him out of the room. They groped their way along the passage, so softly that neither could hear a sound made by the other. A faint glimmer, however, seemed to light the hall for which they were making. Valmeris put his head round the corner. It was a nightlight, placed at the foot of the stairs, on a little table which showed through the frail branches of a palm tree. Halt, whispered Valmeris. Near the nightlight, a man stood sentry, carrying a gun. Had he seen them? Perhaps. At least something must have alarmed him, for he brought the gun to his shoulder. Beautrelet had fallen on his knees, against a tub containing a plant, and he remained quite still, with his heart thumping against his chest. Meanwhile, the silence and the absence of all movement reassured the man. He lowered his weapon, but his head was still turned in the direction of the tub. Terrible minutes passed. Ten minutes, fifteen. A moonbeam had glided through a window on the staircase, and suddenly Beautrelet became aware that the moonbeam was shifting imperceptibly, and that before fifteen before ten more minutes had elapsed, it would be shining full in his face. Great drops of perspiration fell from his forehead on his trembling hands. His anguish was such that he was on the point of getting up and running away, but remembering that Valmeris was there, he sought him with his eyes and was astounded to see him, or rather to imagine him, creeping in the dark under cover of the statues and plants. He was already at the foot of the stairs, within a few steps of the man. What was he going to do? To pass, in spite of all? To go upstairs alone and release the prisoner? But could he pass? Beautrelet no longer saw him, and he had an impression that something was about to take place, something that seemed foreboded also by the silence, which hung heavier, more awful than before. And suddenly, a shadow springing upon the man the nightlight extinguished, the sound of a struggle. Beautrelet ran up. The two bodies had rolled over on the flagstones. He tried to stoop and see, but he heard a hoarse moan, a sigh, and one of the adversaries rose to his feet and seized him by the arm. Quick, come along! It was Valmeris. They went up two stories and came out at the entrance to a corridor, covered by a hanging. To the right, whispered Valmeris, the fourth room on the left. 
they soon found the door of the room. As they expected, the captive was locked in. It took them half an hour, half an hour of stifled efforts, of muffled attempts to force open the lock. The door yielded at last. Beautrelet groped his way to the bed. His father was asleep. He woke him gently. It's I, Isidore, and a friend. Don't be afraid. Get up. Not a word. The father dressed himself, but as they were leaving the room he whispered, I am not alone in the castle. Ah, who else? Ganimard? Holmes? No, at least I have not seen them. Who, then? A young girl. Mademoiselle de saint varin no doubt. I don't know. I saw her several times at a distance, in the park, and when I lean out of my window I can see hers. She has made signals to me. Do you know which is her room? Yes, in this passage, the third on the right. The blue room, murmured Valmeras. It has folding doors. They won't give us so much trouble. One of the two leaves very soon gave way. Old Beautrelet undertook to tell the girl. Ten minutes later, he left the room with her and said to his son, You were right, Mademoiselle de saint varin They all four went down the stairs. When they reached the bottom, Valmeris stopped and bent over the man, then leading them to the terrace room. He is not dead, he said. He will live. Oh, said Beautrelet with a sigh of relief. No, fortunately the blade of my knife bent. The blow is not fatal. Besides, in any case, those rascals deserve no pity. Outside they were met by the dogs, which accompanied them to the postern. Here, Beautrelet found his two friends, and the little band left the park. It was three o'clock in the morning. This first victory was not enough to satisfy Beautrelet. As soon as he had comfortably settled his father and Mademoiselle de saint varin he asked them about the people who lived at the castle, and particularly about the habits of Arsène Lupin. He thus learned that Lupin came only every three or four days, arriving at night in his motor-car and leaving again in the morning. At each of his visits he called separately upon his two prisoners, both of whom agreed in praising his courtesy and his extreme civility. For the moment he was not at the castle. Apart from him, they had seen no one except an old woman, who ruled over the kitchen and the house, and two men, who kept watch over them by turns and never spoke to them. Subordinates, obviously, to judge by their manners and appearance. Two accomplices for all that, said Beautrelet in conclusion, or rather three with the old woman. It is a bag worth having, and if we lose no time... He jumped on his bicycle, rode to Aiguzon, woke up the gendarmerie, set them all going, made them sound the boot and saddle, and returned to Crozon at eight o'clock, accompanied by the sergeant and eight gendarmes. Two of the men were posted beside the gypsy van. Two others took up their positions outside the postern door. The last four, commanded by their chief and accompanied by Beautrelet and Valmeras, marched to the main entrance of the castle. Too late. The door was wide open. A peasant told them that he had seen a motor car drive out of the castle an hour before. Indeed, the search led to no result. In all probability, the gang had installed themselves there picnic fashion. A few clothes were found, a little linen, some household implements, and that was all. What astonished Beautrelet and Valmeris more was the disappearance of the wounded man. They could not see the faintest trace of a struggle, not even a drop of blood on the flagstones of the hall. All said, there was no material evidence to prove the fleeting presence of Lupin at the Chateau de Languia, and the authorities would have been entitled to challenge the statements of Beautrelet and his father, of Valmeris and Mademoiselle de saint varin had they not ended by discovering, in a room next to that occupied by the young girl, some half-dozen exquisite bouquets with Arsène Lupin's card pinned to them. Bouquets scorned by her, faded and forgotten. 
one of them, in addition to the card, contained a letter which Raymond had not seen. That afternoon, when opened by the examining magistrate, it was found to contain page upon page of prayers, entreaties, promises, threats, despair, all the madness of a love that has encountered nothing but contempt and repulsion. And the letter ended. I shall come on Tuesday evening, Raymond. Reflect between now and then. As for me, I will wait no longer. I am resolved on all. Tuesday evening was the evening of the very day on which Beautrelet had released Mademoiselle de saint varin from her captivity. The reader will remember the extraordinary explosion of surprise and enthusiasm that resounded throughout the world at the news of that unexpected issue, Mademoiselle de saint varin free, the pretty girl whom Lupin coveted, to secure whom he had contrived his most Machiavellian schemes, snatched from his claws, free also Beautrelet's father, whom Lupin had chosen as a hostage in his extravagant longing for the armistice demanded by the needs of his passion. They were both free, the two prisoners, and the secret of the hollow needle was known, published, flung to the four corners of the world. The crowd amused itself with a will. Ballads were sold and sung about the defeated adventurer, Lupin's little love affairs, Arzen's piteous sobs, the lovesick burglar, the pickpocket's lament. They were cried on the boulevards and hummed in the artist's studios. Raymond, pressed with questions and pursued by interviewers, replied with the most extreme reserve. But there was no denying the letter, or the bouquets of flowers, or any part of the pitiful story. Then and there, Lupin, scoffed and jeered at, toppled from his pedestal, and Beautrelet became the popular idol. He had foretold everything, thrown light on everything, the evidence which Mademoiselle de saint varin gave before the examining magistrate confirmed, down to the smallest detail, the hypothesis imagined by Isidore. Reality seemed to submit, in every point, to what he had decreed beforehand. Lupin had found his master. Beautrelet insisted that his father, before returning to his mountains in Savoy, should take a few months' rest in the sunshine, and himself escorted him and Mademoiselle de saint varin to the outskirts of Nice, where the Comte de Gevre and his daughter Suzanne were already settled for the winter. Two days later, Valmeris brought his mother to see his new friends, and they thus composed a little colony, grouped around the Via de Gevre, and watched over day and night by half a dozen men engaged by the Comte. Early in October, Beautrelet, once more the sixth-form pupil, returned to Paris to resume the interrupted course of his studies and to prepare for his examinations. And life began again, calmer this time, and free from incident. What could happen for that matter? Was the war not over? Lupin, on his side, must have felt this very clearly must have felt that there was nothing left for him but to resign himself to the accomplished fact. For one fine day, his two other victims, Ganimard and Sherlock Holmes, made their reappearance. Their return to the life of this planet, however, was devoid of any sort of glamour or fascination. An itinerant ragman picked them up on the Quai des Orfèvres, opposite the headquarters of police. Both of them were gagged, bound, and fast asleep. After a week of complete bewilderment, they succeeded in recovering the control of their thought, and told, or rather Ganimard told, for Holmes wrapped himself in a fierce and stubborn silence, how they had made a voyage of circumnavigation round the coast of Africa on board the yacht Hirondelle, a voyage combining amusement with instruction, during which they could look upon themselves as free, save for a few hours which they spent at the bottom of the hold, while the crew went on shore at outlandish ports. As for their landing on the Quai des Orfèvres, they remembered nothing about it, 
and had probably been asleep for many days before. This liberation of the prisoners was the final confession of defeat. By ceasing to fight, Lupin admitted it without reserve. One incident, moreover, made it still more glaring, which was the engagement of Louis Valmeris and Mademoiselle de saint varin In the intimacy created between them by the new conditions under which they lived, the two young people fell in love with each other. Valmeris loved Raymond's melancholy charm, and she, wounded by life, greedy for protection, yielded before the strength and energy of the man who had contributed so gallantly to her preservation. The wedding day was awaited with a certain amount of anxiety. Would Lupin not try to resume the offensive? Would he accept with a good grace the irretrievable loss of the woman he loved? Twice or three times, suspicious-looking people were seen prowling round the villa, and Valmeris even had to defend himself one evening against a so-called drunken man, who fired a pistol at him and sent a bullet through his hat. But, in the end, the ceremony was performed at the appointed hour and day, and Raymond de saint varin became Madame Louis Valmeras. It was as though fate herself had taken sides with Beautrelet and countersigned the news of victory. This was so apparent to the crowd that his admirers now conceived the notion of entertaining him at a banquet to celebrate his triumph and Lupin's overthrow. It was a great idea, and aroused general enthusiasm. Three hundred tickets were sold in less than a fortnight. Invitations were issued to the public schools of Paris to send two sixth-form pupils apiece. The press sang paeans. The banquet was what it could not fail to be, an apotheosis. But it was a charming and simple apotheosis, because Beautrelet was its hero. His presence was enough to bring things back to their due proportion. He showed himself modest as usual, a little surprised at the excessive cheering, a little embarrassed by the extravagant panegyrics in which he was pronounced greater than the most illustrious detectives, a little embarrassed, but also not a little touched. He said as much in a few words that pleased all his hearers, and with the shyness of a child that blushes when you look at it. He spoke of his delight, of his pride, and really, reasonable and self-controlled as he was, this was for him a moment of never-to-be-forgotten exultation. He smiled to his friends, to his fellow Jansonians, to Valmeras, who had come specially to give him a cheer, to Monsieur de Gevre, to his father. When he had finished speaking, and while he still held his glass in his hand, a sound of voices came from the other end of the room, and someone was gesticulating and waving a newspaper. Silence was restored, and the importunate person sat down again, but a thrill of curiosity ran round the table. The newspaper was passed from hand to hand, and each time that one of the guests cast his eyes upon the page at which it was opened, exclamations followed. Read it! Read it! they cried from the opposite side. The people were leaving their seats at the principal table. Monsieur Beautrelet went and took the paper and handed it to his son. Read it out! Read it out! they cried, louder, and others said, Listen, he's going to read it. Listen! Beautrelet stood facing his audience, looked in the evening paper, which his father had given him for the article that was causing all this uproar, and suddenly his eyes encountering a heading underlined in blue pencil, he raised his hand to call for silence and began in a loud voice to read a letter addressed to the editor by Monsieur Massiban of the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres. His voice broke and fell little by little as he read those stupefying revelations, which reduced all his efforts to nothing upset his notions concerning the hollow needle, and proved the vanity of his struggle with Arsène Lupin. Sir, on the 17th of March, 1679, there appeared a little book with the following title, The Mystery of the Hollow Needle. The whole truth now first exhibited. One hundred copies printed by myself for the instruction of the court. 
At nine o'clock on the morning of that day, the author, a very young man, well-dressed, whose name has remained unknown, began to leave his book on the principal persons at court. At ten o'clock, when he had fulfilled four of these errands, he was arrested by a captain in the guards, who took him to the king's closet, and forthwith set off in search of the four copies distributed. When the hundred copies were got together, counted, carefully looked through, and verified, the king himself threw them into the fire and burnt them, all but one, which he kept for his own purposes. Then he ordered the captain of the guards to take the author of the book to Monsieur de saint mars who confined his prisoner first at Pignerol, and then in the fortress of the Ile Saint Marguerite. This man was obviously no other than the famous man with the iron mask. The truth would never have been known, or at least a part of the truth, if the captain of the guards had not been present at the interview, and if, when the king's back was turned, he had not been tempted to withdraw another of the copies from the chimney before the fire got to it. Six months later, the captain was found dead on the high road between Gaillon and Mantes. His murderers had stripped him of all his apparel, forgetting, however, in his right boot a jewel, which was discovered there afterward, a diamond of the first water, and of considerable value. Among his papers was found a sheet in his handwriting, in which he did not speak of the book snatched from the flames, but gave a summary of the earlier chapters. It referred to a secret, which was known to the kings of England, which was lost by them when the crown passed from the poor fool King Henry the Sixth to the Duke of York, which was revealed to Charles the Seventh, King of France, by Joan of Arc, and which, becoming a state secret, was handed down from sovereign to sovereign by means of a letter, sealed anew on each occasion, which was found in the deceased monarch's deathbed, with the superscription, For the King of France. This secret concerned the existence and described the whereabouts of a tremendous treasure, belonging to the kings, which increased in dimensions from century to century. One hundred and fourteen years later, Louis the Sixteenth, then a prisoner in the temple, took aside one of the officers whose duty it was to guard the royal family, and asked, "'Monsieur, had you not an ancestor who served as a captain under my predecessor, the great king? Yes, sire. Well, could you be relied upon? Could you be relied upon?' He hesitated. The officer completed the sentence. "'Not to betray your majesty? Oh, sire! Then listen to me.' He took from his pocket a little book, of which he tore out one of the last pages, but, altering his mind, "'No, I had better copy it.' He seized a large sheet of paper and tore it in such a way as to leave only a small rectangular space, on which he copied five lines of dots, letters and figures, from the printed page. Then, after burning the latter, he folded the manuscript sheet in four, sealed it with red wax, and gave it to the officer. "'Monsieur, after my death you must hand this to the Queen, and say to her, From the King, Madame, for your Majesty and for your son. If she does not understand—' "'If she does not understand, sire?' "'You must add, it concerns the secret, the secret of the needle. The Queen will understand.' When he had finished speaking, he flung the book into the embers glowing on the hearth. He ascended the scaffold on the 21st of January. It took the officer several months, in consequence of the removal of the Queen to the conciergerie, before he could fulfil the mission with which he was entrusted. At last, by dint of cunning intrigues, he succeeded one day in finding himself in the presence of Marie Antoinette. Speaking so that she could just hear him, he said— Madame, from the late king, your husband, for your majesty and your son. And he gave her the sealed letter. She satisfied herself that the jailers could not see her, broke the seals, appeared surprised at the sight of those undecipherable lines, and then all at once seemed to understand. She smiled bitterly, and the officer caught the words, Why so late? She hesitated. 
where should she hide this dangerous document? At last she opened her book of hours and slipped the paper into a sort of secret pocket, contrived between the leather of the binding and the parchment that covered it. Why so late? she had asked. It is in fact probable that this document, if it could have saved her, came too late, for in the month of October next, Queen Marie Antoinette ascended the scaffold in her turn. Now the officer, when going through his family papers, came upon his ancestor's manuscript. From that moment he had but one idea, which was to devote his leisure to elucidating this strange problem. He read all the Latin authors, studied all the chronicles of France and those of the neighbouring countries, visited the monasteries, deciphered account books, cartularies, treaties, and in this way succeeded in discovering certain references scattered over the ages. In Book Three of Caesar's Commentaries on the Gallic War, Manuscript Edition Alexandria, it is stated that, after the defeat of Veridovix by G. Titulius Sabinus, the chief of the Caleti was brought before Caesar, and that for his ransom he revealed the secret of the needle. The treaty of Saint-Clair-sur-Ept between Charles the Simple and Rollo, the chief of the Norse barbarians, gives Rollo's name followed by all his titles, among which we read that of Master of the Secret of the Needle. The Saxon Chronicle, Gibson's edition, page 134, speaking of William the Conqueror, says that the staff of his banner ended in a steel point pierced with an eye like a needle. In a rather ambiguous phrase in her examination, Joan of Arc admits that she has still a great secret to tell the King of France, to which her judges reply, Yes, we know of what you speak, and that, Joan, is why you shall die the death. Philippe de Comine mentions it in connection with Louis the Eleventh, and later Sully in connection with Henry the Fourth, by the virtue of the needle, the good king sometimes swears. Between these two, Francis I, in a speech addressed to the notables of the Havre, in 1520, uttered this phrase, which has been handed down in the diary of Honfleur Burgess. The kings of France carry secrets that often decide the conduct of affairs and the fate of towns. All these quotations, all the stories relating to the Iron Mask, the captain of the guards and his descendant, I have found today in a pamphlet, written by this same descendant, and published in the month of June, 1815, just before or just after the Battle of Waterloo, in a period, therefore, of great upheavals, in which the revelations which it contained were likely to pass unperceived. What is the value of this pamphlet? Nothing, you will tell me, and we must attach no credit to it. And this is the impression which I myself would have carried away if it had not occurred to me to open Caesar's commentaries at the chapter given. What was my astonishment when I came upon the phrase quoted in the little book before me? And it was the same thing with the Treaty of saint clair sur Epte, with the Saxon Chronicle, with the examination of Joan of Arc, in short, with all that I have been able to verify up to the present. Lastly, there is an even more precise fact related by the author of the pamphlet of 1815. During the French campaign, he being then an officer under Napoleon, his horse dropped dead one evening, and he rang at the door of a castle where he was received by an old knight of St. Louis, and in the course of conversation with the old man, he learnt that this castle, standing on the bank of the Creuse, was called the Chateau de Longuy that it had been built and christened by Louis the Fourteenth, and that, by his express order, it was adorned with turrets and with a spire which represented the needle. As its dated bore, it must still bear the figure 1680. 1680. One year after the publication of the book and the imprisonment of the Iron Mask. Everything was now explained. Louis the Fourteenth, foreseeing that the secret might be noised abroad, had built and named that castle so as to offer the quidnuncs a natural explanation of the ancient mystery. 
the hollow needle, a castle with pointed bell turrets standing on the bank of the Creuse and belonging to the king. People would at once think that they had the key to the riddle and all enquiries would cease. The calculation was just, seeing that more than two centuries later, Monsieur Beautrelet fell into the trap. And this, sir, is what I was leading up to in writing this letter. If Lupin, under the name of Anfredi, rented from Monsieur Valmeras, the Chateau de Languier, on the bank of the Creuse, if, admitting the success of the inevitable investigations of Monsieur Beautrelet, he lodged his two prisoners there, it was because he admitted the success of the inevitable researches made by Monsieur Beautrelet, and because with the object of obtaining the peas for which he had asked, he laid for Monsieur Beautrelet precisely what we may call the historic trap of Louis the Fourteenth. And hence we come to this undeniable conclusion, that he, Lupin, by his unaided lights, without possessing any other facts than those which we possess, managed, by means of the witchcraft of a really extraordinary genius, to decipher the undecipherable document, and that he, Lupin, the last heir of the kings of France, knows the royal mystery of the hollow needle. Here ended the letter. But for some minutes, from the passage that referred to the Chateau de Longuia onward, it was not Beautrelet's but another voice that read it aloud. Realizing his defeat, crushed under the weight of his humiliation, Isidore had dropped the newspaper and sunk into his chair, with his face buried in his hands. Panting, shaken with excitement by this incredible story, the crowd had come gradually nearer and was now pressing round. With a thrill of anguish, they waited for the words which he would say in reply, the objections which he would raise. He did not stir. Valmeris gently uncrossed his hands and raised his head. Isidore Beautrelet was weeping. Chapter 7 The Treatise of the Needle It is four o'clock in the morning. Isidore has not returned to the Lycée Janson. He has no intention of returning before the end of the war of extermination which he has declared against Lupin. This much he swore to himself under his breath, while his friends drove off with him, all faint and bruised, in a cab. A mad oath. An absurd and illogical war. What can he do? A single unarmed stripling, against that phenomenon of energy and strength. On which side is he to attack him? He is unassailable. Where to wound him? He is invulnerable. Where to get at him? He is inaccessible. Four o'clock in the morning. Isidore has again accepted his schoolfellow's hospitality. Standing before the chimney in his bedroom, with his elbows flat on the mantel shelf and his two fists under his chin, he stares at his image in the looking-glass. He is not crying now. He can shed no more tears, nor fling himself about on his bed, nor give way to despair, as he has been doing for the last two hours and more. He wants to think, to think and understand. And he does not remove his eyes from those same eyes reflected in the glass as though he hoped to double his powers of thought by contemplating his pensive image, as though he hoped to find at the back of that mirrored Beautrelet the unsolvable solution of what he does not find within himself. He stands thus until six o'clock, and little by little the question presents itself to his mind with the strictness of an equation, bare and dry, and cleared of all the details that complicate and obscure it. Yes, he has made a mistake. Yes, his reading of the document is all wrong. The word Anguilla does not point to the castle on the cruise. Also, the word Demoiselle cannot be applied to Raymond de saint Véran and her cousin, because the text of the document dates back for centuries. Therefore, all must be done over again, from the beginning. How? 
one piece of evidence alone would be incontestable, the book published under Louis XIV. Now, of those hundred copies printed by the person who was presumed to be the man with the iron mask, only two escaped the flames. One was purloined by the captain of the guards and lost. The other was kept by Louis XIV, handed down to Louis XV, and burnt by Louis XVI. But a copy of the essential page, the page containing the solution of the problem, or at least a cryptographic solution, was conveyed to Marie Antoinette, who slipped it into the binding of her book of hours. What has become of this paper? Is it the one which Beautrelet has held in his hands, and which Lupin recovered from him through Bredot, the magistrate's clerk? Or is it still in Marie Antoinette's book of hours? And the question resolves itself into this. What has become of the Queen's Book of Hours? After taking a short rest, Beautrelet consulted his friend's father, an old and experienced collector, who was often called upon officially to give an expert opinion and who had quite lately been invited to advise the director of one of our museums on the drawing up of the catalogue. Marie Antoinette's Book of Hours, he exclaimed. Why, the Queen left it for her waiting woman, with secret instructions to forward it to Count Furston. After being piously preserved in the Count's family, it has been for the last five years in a glass case. A glass case? In the Musée Carnavalet, quite simply. When will the museum be open? At twenty minutes from now, as it is every morning. Isidore and his friend jumped out of a cab at the moment when the doors of Madame de Savine's old mansion were opening. Hello, Monsieur Beautrelet! A dozen voices greeted his arrival. To his great surprise, he recognized the whole crowd of reporters who were following up the mystery of the hollow needle, and one of them exclaimed, Funny, isn't it, that we should all have had the same idea? Take care, Arsène Lupin may be among us. They entered the museum together. The director was at once informed, placed himself entirely at their disposal, took them to the glass case, and skewed them a poor little volume, devoid of all ornament, which certainly had nothing royal about it. Nevertheless, they were overcome by a certain emotion at the sight of this object which the queen had touched in those tragic days, which her eyes, red with tears, had looked upon. And they dared not take it and hunt through it. It was as though they feared lest they should be guilty of a sacrilege. Come, Monsieur Beautrelet, it's your business. He took the book with an anxious gesture. The description corresponded with that given by the author of the pamphlet. Outside was a parchment cover, dirty, stained, and worn in places, and under it the real binding in stiff leather. With what a thrill Beautrelet felt for the hidden pocket. Was it a fairy tale? Or would he find the document written by Louis the Sixteenth, and bequeathed by the Queen to her fervent admirer? At the first page, on the upper side of the book, there was no receptacle. Nothing, he muttered. Nothing, they echoed, palpitating with excitement. But at the last page, forcing back the book a little, he at once saw that the parchment was not stuck to the binding. He slipped his fingers in between. There was something. Yes, he felt something, a paper. Oh, he gasped, in an accent almost of pain. Here, is it possible? Quick, quick, they cried. What are you waiting for? He drew out a sheet folded in two. Well, read it. There are words in red ink. Look, it might be blood, pale, faded blood. Read it! He read. To you, Fersen, for my son. 16th October, 1793. Marie Antoinette. And suddenly Beautrelet gave a cry of stupefaction. Under the Queen's signature there were... There were two words in black ink, underlined with a flourish. Two words. 
آزن دوپن This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Hollow Needle, Part 5 of 7, by Maurice LeBlanc. If you've enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs> <laughs>